these are my weapons. This is what I have to go through every day in order to, to, be, to, to feel like I'm safe. These two slip by my bed. And then this one stays there. If I don't grab this, at least maybe they take me to the front. I will have a knife or shaft somewhere. If not, I'm going to catch this. I fall down and then I use this to protect myself. Just think of that kind of a life. South Africa's post-apartheid constitution was the first in the world to outlaw discrimination based on sexual orientation. It was the fifth country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. But despite these progressive laws, many of South Africa's LGBTQIA community lives in fear, simply for being who they are. A spate of brutal killings have left this community reeling. of coming and crying when people and people in our community die. How many of us must be slain for this country to take us seriously? So as we hand over this memorandum that I'm about to read, I think that must be clear that we haven't won today's battle. We have not won the battle of Gululu and the many people who have slain before them because our government behind those gates does not take us seriously. The society at large in this country does not take us seriously. The media of this country does not take us seriously. That fucking police service does not take us seriously. That is the reality of queer people in this country. I was born in Manfletcher, in a small village that people are still suffering until today. We don't have water, we don't have electricity. When it's dark, you can't even see your own finger. So I grew up there from my family's mother's side, and it was nice. Those people were not rich, but they were humble. They were nice, you know, when you get there, if they don't have a chicken in the yard, they're gonna go somewhere and get a chicken and slaughter a chicken for you because you're the grandchild and then you are here. And then that's a blessing for them. So I grew up there. I was a productive child and then I always do what the boys do. I always love fighting karate and all that stuff. <laughs> and then you get hurt along the way, but you're learning. So I grew up as a, that child that does not take bullshit. <laughs> But when our corner was eight years old, she was moved to live with her father's side of the family when her mother relocated to Cape Town. That is where I was ill-treated. I was eight because I'm born in 1990-01-01. So I was eight. A corner was raped repeatedly by two family members. And then they will make it look like I have to do that. I have anger against them. Akona silently suffered this abuse for a year before she moved to Cape Town to be with her mother. This is where she slowly started to realize her attraction to women and her romantic disinterest in men. Everything was fine, but I always had that interest in women, so I saw myself slowly, but me and guys, 
we don't do very well because from my point of view, from the type of society that we're growing up into, many guys have no idea how to, how to treat a woman. So to see a strong black woman that is not sleeping with them is a problem. To see a woman that goes into a tavern and buy her own beer is a problem. To see, for instance, I don't date around here. To see someone fresh from another location, hot and all that, is a problem for them. To be living out is a problem with them. Akona is now 32 years old, living alone in Kailicha, a township in Cape Town where people face extreme socio-economic challenges and daily life is a constant struggle for most. Life for a lesbian woman in this community is even more dangerous. The guys, they're saying I'm trying, I'm trying to make myself be like a man, which is I'm not trying to be a man, I'm not trying to be anything, I'm just myself. So I do not know what I have to prove to them to be a woman. Maybe I have to sleep with them, then they can confirm that I'm a woman, which is something I will never do. Corrective rape, a hate crime perpetrated against gay people with the intention of turning them heterosexual, is a brutal reality facing many lesbian women in communities across South Africa. There was one guy who was living here at the back. We usually sit together, we share drinks, but that day, all of a sudden I was still sitting and then we were chatting. And I, I don't get drunk, I only get drunk when I get home because I've seen the kind of people that are around. Well, today you can be saying this, but in a split of a moment, you'll be doing something else. So I, I'm always protective over myself. So we drank, we drank, and it was just two or three beers. And then we're having a chat with you, watching TV. Out of nowhere, he grabbed me. And then he took me down, we fought and all of that stuff but I was powerless and then he raped me, thinking that maybe I'm going to change. A corner is only one of the many victims in South Africa's LGBTQIA plus community who have had hate crimes perpetrated against them. In 2021, deaths in this community reached double digits. In July last year, the Department of Justice said it dealt with 42 hate crime cases. Instead of pride parades, in 2021, angry community members took to the streets in protest against the rise in homophobic attacks. So our fight is not just against Abandu who are in parliament, but the people we live with every day. Mm. Our friends who love tokenizing us, but aren't here to stand in solidarity with yeah. us today. Do not name us, do not shame us. Mm. We let them, we not the names. We ask we you, we won. Mm. Hands off the community. Yeah. We're done begging the South African public, we're done begging the South African government. We're here to demand for actual change and actual uh, 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 shifting of these things that we're calling. This tiny little response here is in answer to one of the most horrible things that can happen to a citizen of a country. No, you measure it. Honestly, it is so hard to believe that in all these years, of advocating, of providing services, of providing spaces, 
of working with communities, working in schools, working with stakeholders, that we are still in a place where attitudes um, in many places have not shifted. And so we find ourselves today where we have had a spike throughout the country of murders perpetrated against LGBTI people. And that is a sad indictment on us as, as a nation, as human beings, that so easily a life can be snuffed out just for being who we are in the world. It's quite traumatic to even just bring up what South Africa is experiencing for our like queer communities. Um, to just be queer and be out is it's quite a statement and it's you're risking your life to be able to just be yourself. It's quite scary to go like, hey, I want to be out and I'm choosing to be out. But some of my sisters and brothers in our communities and across South Africa have to hide what they're wearing, hide who they are, hide who they're loving because we are violently targeted and um, it's really, I mean, it's on like a back burner in the government um, to just kind of be addressed. And yeah, it's quite sad. These are, these are the people that I hang around with because I don't want to be in trouble with the same age group as mine. is the issue of hanging around with the same people, same mentality. So you will never gain anything. So if you have less information, you're gonna act less because you have no information. So it's a, it's a matter of, we need awareness, we, we need like many things. And then people around here, you can say this one is interested, but it's not interested to come out. So it's a matter of confidence and it's a matter of like there is less education, there is less awareness. So with little information, there's probably nothing you can do. So maybe they think mattering us works for them. On the eve of his 22nd birthday, Lonwabo Jack went out to celebrate with his friends in Inyanga East, Cape Town. But an evening meant for making happy memories will now be remembered for much worse. Our immediate action was to go and see. We didn't believe that it, it could be him. We were desperate to go and see uh, and to witness what is uh, being said. Lorne Weibel was raped and murdered in an alleged homophobic attack. His body, riddled with stab wounds, was found next to a road. He was lying in a pool of his own blood. Uh, without a doubt, he was openly gay, he was proud of himself, even the family was proud. It's just unbelievable that he's gone because he's a human being. He is not, uh, he was not created by me or by someone else, by only by God. When Andile Lulu Ntutela, another member of the LGBTQIA community, was murdered in the Eastern Cape in April, a group of protesters marched to Parliament. They handed over a memorandum in which they called for an urgent debate on hate crimes. 
we also have to call on government to finally step away from its complacency in dealing with hate crimes against queer people in this body. We want the hate crimes bill to stop sitting around in parliament and actually get to the people, right? We want a debate in that national parliament that actually discusses the real realities of queer people in this country and not the facade that is sold to us in our constitution. The Prevention and Combating of Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Bill was introduced to Parliament in April 2018. But over the past three years, it's been gathering dust. And it will keep on failing to protect South Africa's most vulnerable citizens until it's processed and passed into law. What is there to celebrate when our very own government still stands there and not passing the hate crimes bill? What is there to celebrate when many Africans and many South Africans have been murdered because of their sexuality? Actually, we exist in paper in this country. We exist in the constitution of this country. Uh, there's no action that our government is taking towards um, the perpetrators of this country that are attacking and murdering the LGBTQ community. Law professor Pierre de Foss supports the passing of the bill, but cautions that it alone won't necessarily have a significant impact on the lived realities of the LGBTQIA plus community. So what a hate crimes legislation would do, um, it would say that if you commit a crime that's already a crime, like assault or rape or murder, and you do it because, uh, you, because of the hatred um, or antagonism you have towards somebody because of their sexuality, then you will get a heavier sentence. Obviously, that alone, that's not a magic bullet. But it plays a symbolic role, obviously, in saying we, the state, we recognize that there are these hate crimes and that they are, um, in a way, even worse in the impact that it has on specific communities like the LGBTQ community. Um, but that on its own is not going to begin even to address the problem because the problem is societal, um, prejudices, it is about uh, inequality, economic issues, all of those things. Um, and those things are difficult to change because they are structural. In a statement, the Department of Justice and Correctional Services in August last year said the processing of the bill was delayed as they awaited the Kuelani Constitutional Court judgment. The judgment related to offensive language used towards the LGBTQIA community. They said a date will be announced in the near future for the opening of the Hate Crimes Bill for public engagement, an integral part of the processing of a bill in Parliament. Sharon Cox, founder of The Triangle Project, an MPO offering professional services to the LGBTQIA community and their allies, believes civil society needs to rise up and pressure government into action in terms of government silence and therefore lack of political will, you don't hear the president come out making strong statements and having um, the same impetus that you saw government having around um, other cases. Uh, there was a spate of, of young women being murdered, for example, and that the president came out and made very strong statements. I know what you are all going through. Yes, I know. But not without civil society rising up and saying enough is enough. But until the laws of our constitution are adopted into the minds of our citizenry and steadfastly upheld by the rule of law, access to safe spaces is a crucial step in protecting members of this community, specifically in areas with fewer resources. The only time I can go out around here is when I'm in town. What's the kind of life is that? And then don't forget, from here to town is like 30 minutes. So in order for me to feel like I'm safe, I'm free, 
I need to be in town because I know there are securities, policemen are always running around. So why can't we have the same privileges as here? Because what they can do, they can secure this place if they want to. I think it's really, really sad and it's predominantly for me, yes, we all want to have fun somewhere, but more importantly, when there aren't safe spaces, it's literally about safety. And I'm sad that there are a lot of queer spaces closing down at the moment because of COVID and not being able to survive. The, it's not just a sad thing because we can't all like dance and have fun together. It's a sad thing because sometimes it's the only place where you can be queer and not be in harm's way for it. And not having that is uh, like life threatening, much more so than I think people realize when they just go like, oh, you all just want to party. It's not about partying, it's about being able to be ourselves and express ourselves in a space that's safe. Dr. Nynx McLean, a researcher who specializes in LGBTQIA plus identities and communities, highlights why access to these spaces is so important. We, we've got only a small handful of, of safe queer spaces, LGBTIQ spaces. Um, and those are quite significant because, you know, outside of those spaces, there are very few spaces where people are safe. Um, we've seen the, the, what seems to be a spike in homophobia related crimes or hate crimes, as we call them. Um, and I think it's very difficult to judge whether you're safe in any particular space. So if you are in a space, for instance, like, um, you know, the Raptor Room in Cape Town, that's very clearly a safe space um, or a support group space, such as those hosted by any NGOs such as the Triangle Project, for instance, then you, you know you're with your people, essentially, and you are hopefully safe in that space um, and that you have solidarity. So there are other people like you in the space who can stand up. But outside of that, it's very difficult. The Raptor Room in Cape Town is an example of a queer-friendly space that has had to close its doors due to COVID-19 and the associated economic pressures. Owner Amy Lilly is concerned that an already small industry is shrinking even further. Just for the past year and a half, with COVID being a business owner by myself, I can't take the financial, continued financial knocks that is happening because of the continuing pandemic. So I've made the decision to close um, just because I financially can't support this anymore, even though I love it so much. Because spaces allow people to uh, build a community, a sense of trust, a sense that they're being seen by other people, um, that they're important. So if there's not a lot of them, then that might die. The way that Cape Town is built has always been to push people out and to keep certain people in because people don't have access to this area and I think that's a big problem with queer community and I would love to do more outreach in townships. It makes me sad that I can't reach everyone with a space just because of where we're located and how everything's been set up in our country but it definitely is a big problem that we should address as a queer community and we should stand up for more. That everyone should have access to queer spaces. We've often spoken about LGBTIQ plus people in terms of their sexuality and we don't really think about them as having multiple lived experiences or multiple forms of oppression. So race in particular, particularly post apartheid based race, so you know the, the continued structural inequality um, and class. So you're not able to access these spaces which are still predominantly white and still very wealthy. It's not good enough to be able to say only if you live in one of the big metropolitan areas can you access services because often the people who need the services most are the ones who do not live um, in big city centres. Our struggle is often, and the struggle for many other NPOs and NGOs and CBOs, is that rural areas are often left out. Um, and even for ourselves, it is intense work, it's resource intense work, it is difficult often to find funding to be able to do that kind of work and to provide the services that you want to provide in rural areas.
Sibo Siso Nkunkreka co-founded the Kulani Kaili Chukwe Hub in 2008 as a safe space for the LGBTQIA community, offering a haven for people rejected by their families and a space to share their experiences. People have different experiences, if I could say. Let me start with me, for example. I was being beaten because of my sexuality, torn with stones, cold with words, what most of the LGBTI community goes through, more especially the African gay men go through on a daily basis in this country and into our communities. So people, um, some of them will be raped because of their sexuality, some were beaten because of their sexuality, some were thrown out of their homes because of their sexuality. So that's when I saw the need actually to start the organization that I have today. Sibo Siso focuses on providing services in less privileged areas outside of the city where there are fewer safe spaces available and where LGBTQIA plus people face even more threats for being who they are. The fire is there. It is there where we're staying. It, the, that's where it's, it's in the heart of Kailicha, the heart of Kukulitu, the heart of Nyanga. That's where the issues are. That's where the social issues are. Not here in town. Here in town, everything is fine, you walk gaily, you do whatsoever, because you are protected and you are walking within the privileged. You understand? And there in Kailicha, it's another story. Gender offers a safe house for lesbian women in Kailicha who have been victims of hate crimes like corrective rape and have nowhere else to go. People don't understand and they don't want to learn. You see, they, the, this thing of them that is instilled in their minds will never like change. You see, as much as we keep on educating people and like I don't understand why we should um, educate people of who we are, you see. And uh, when we say that we, they, we want them to tolerate us, it means that we want them to, we, we're more like saying that we want them to own, they're owning this world and we are just here because we are just here. So people hate what they don't know, as I said. So they don't want to learn and they stop on. I won't even bother to go to the police station. For instance, in something like a rape, they can say this person is not guilty until found it guilty. To my resolution, it's, it's, it doesn't help. Instead, you're going to create a bad space from where you're staying. Because after reporting that guy getting arrested for those 24 hours or whatsoever, he comes back and you are dead. According to the so-called system, it's no longer working for the people. We need new laws, we need new rules. In fact, we need new history. There's so many unreported cases, to be honest with you. There's so many guys who've came to me, they can't go to the police station to report the cases. You know why? Because the prejudice and stigma is within the uh, SAPS services, the institution itself. If you go to the police station, for example, you'll be laughed. Um, if let's say you're gay and you, you got raped and you go to the police station, you, you, you go to report the case, you'll be laughed because you are gay. Uh, you've been raped by another man. We have become, we've become a laughing stock. Hence, so many people don't go to reported cases. Hence, so many people don't go to seek medical attention because we have become a laughing stock instead of getting the help that we require. In response to a list of questions sent by News 24, the Western Cape Police said they'd issued a standard of operating procedure to respect, protect and promote the rights of LGBTQIA persons. They also promised that more swift action would be taken if these standards weren't met. According to police spokesperson Colonel Andre Trout, a guide on protecting LGBTQIA persons had also been provided at all community service centres at more than 150 police stations. This guide contains prescripts on how to work with members of the community when dealing with complaints of this nature. 
Members of the public are encouraged to bring forth any grievances to the police's internal complaints channel. We need to start with the way that we are thinking first and then we need action from government because people from township have been like sidelined and then we need new management, we need us to change that, people that are not selfish. Sometimes it's not about the money, the people need, like we need help. Around here, there's unemployment, people are getting drunk, kids starting from the age of 16. The biggest challenge right now, we do not have a support system, to be honest with you. That's the major part. If we could have perhaps a, a support system when it comes to our um, so the social ills that are happening in our communities. We need a support system, a healthcare support system, a social ills support system, you know, that kind of a triangle thing. We need that kind of support. There are so many ideas and so many plans in place that we have come up, the strategic planning that we have, but we cannot be able to implement them into our communities because we do not have the resources and the funds. It is clear that a significant amount of financial and political input is required to address this crisis and to aid organizations and activists already working to create change. But until such time, community members and leaders remain determined to fight. It's sad, honestly, it's sad because if I can go back to the month of May, we've attended almost um, five marches where we, we march for because of hate crime. So it's sad that we each day we lose people who are part of us, you see. So one thing I can say is that, and that I always say is that the fight will never end. So if this continues, we will fight until we die. I have lots of gay friends that have been killed and it's very painful because I can't do anything about it. They only still live in my memories. I'm very proud. I'm 100% proud to be gay and I wouldn't change it even one day to be something else. <laughs> yeah.